Hello and welcome to another BAFTA Guru panel. Today we are talking about the craft of game art and we've got some incredible panellists lined up. I am very excited for this one but before we get started a little bit of housekeeping as always. So if you need them we have transcription and captions available. They're somewhere at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to select those as an option. And as ever, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this session. So get your questions in early. I'm sure you're familiar with all of our guests. So get those in and we will have a Q&A section at the end of the panel. Now, as I said, we have got fantastic panelists, really brilliant mix of styles and experience today for this panel exploring game art. So I'm just gonna get each panelist to introduce themselves and what they do, starting off with Anna. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Anna Hollenrake. I am a principal artist at MediaType. I specialize in concept art, game development, art direction. Um, I just love making really warm, friendly worlds that these can exist in. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of me. That's what I'm up to at the moment. Fantastic. Chris, how about you? Hi, um, I'm Chris Cox. I'm an art director and illustrator, uh, and I'm lead artist at Us Two Games. Um, I do visual development, concept art, 3D art, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I like to make interesting worlds as well. Brilliant. Catherine, introduce yourself, please. Hello, um, I'm Catherine Unger. Um, I'm an art director and 2D game artist. I started out illustration animation and went on to games and now worked with SFB games on quite a lot of games like Haunt the House, Snip Eclipse and Tangle Tower. And Catherine is also a breakthrough Brit, just, just putting that out there, a BAFTA breakthrough <laughs> Brit, we are, we're all very incredibly proud. Congratulations! So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't mention it, so I had to. <laughs> and finally, Maxim, please tell us everything we need to know about you. Uh, hi, I'm Maxim Fleury. Uh, I'm a lead artist at uh, Gorilla. Uh, I am in charge of the robot and weapons team. Uh, I love to build robots and I before I was in games, I worked in movies for a very long time and uh, yeah, made the transition a couple of years ago and hopefully I can share some knowledge. All right, you mentioned robots, so I'm immediately coming back to you with my first question because that was the coolest job description ever. And I'm interested in what you do day to day or perhaps, you know, week to week, because I know it changes in games. Um, all right, so um, I take care of the team Obviously, make sure that everybody can do their work and not get to build quite so many robots myself these days because I'm just trying to make sure that everybody else can do their job. So as a lead artist, uh, it's also uh, actually quite a bit of producing on the side to make sure that everything is going in the right direction, taking care of um, other parties who might need our stuff or, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, emailing is involved, but I do get uh, some chance to do some work myself. And uh, we we do everything from concept to model to um, talking to the other teams to make sure that the rigging is correct and that the animation animators can work with it and then texturing and, and getting it in game. So it's the whole, the whole pipeline basically. And I'm interested in your day to day as well, because your job is one that I'd honestly, personally, never even really thought about before. Yeah, so I mean, um, I am principal artist, but I get uh, the really, really cool opportunity to lead the art side of pitches. Uh, so no one's going to see uh, what I'm working on for a long time, but I'm absolutely loving it. So I uh, develop initial ideas and game pitches uh, from just like initial documents all the way through to full pitch decks with uh, a world and characters and really fleshing that out. It's got a little bit of design built as well, which I love. Um, so yeah, it's great fun. It means that I have to uh, mess around very quickly in 3D, uh, mocking up environments and scenes, uh, as well as kind of uh, guiding like the teams that come on to help out with that. Uh, it's great fun. It's really cool just the breadth of different things that uh, I have to work on in terms of style, in terms of gameplay. Uh, it's a lot of problem solving very quickly on the fly, uh, but I, I just love it. So. I mean, who knew that there was a games role even more secretive than we're used to? <laughs> <laughs> didn't yeah. know there was a, another level of secrecy. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's like five locks on my door and just like tinfoil <laughs> all, all around my flat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Catherine, tell me a little bit about your day today. Uh, yeah, kind of similar actually, like uh, to the previous two, which is check in with the team in the mornings and then um, have my breakfast. Okay, that's going too far. But basically, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it varies a lot day to day, um, which is, I think, why I like being in games because it's so stimulating. Each day is always a little bit different. So one day I could be doing concept art, like decorating scenes, um, moving stuff around in Unity. I don't know what I'm doing in Unity. And then brainstorming ideas as well. Uh, recently, the weirdest one I did was um, helping out with story stuff. Like I was kind of helping Adam Bayer and SFB Games kind of work through some like story ideas, which was completely so far removed from like the visual side. Um, that was interesting. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then also, yeah, reading and writing 10,000 emails. That's the other thing as well. I know that's the boring bit you always have to add on, isn't it? And a <laughs> lot of emails. <laughs> it's important to include. <laughs> yeah, we're being realistic here. Chris, <laughs> how many emails a day are you dealing with? Um, um, <laughs> countless. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Chris, I was going to keep talking. <laughs> I mean, Catherine, would you like to answer that on my behalf? <laughs> <laughs> um, quite a few emails. I mean, I think my day-to-day -day changes depending on what stage of the project we're at. So right now I'm in like concept and development stage. So the stuff I'm working on is visual development, environment concepts, character concepts, starting to build up the kind of, like we call it a lookbook of what the world will be. And then as the team grows, as we get into pre-production and start development in full, my role shifts over to more art management. Like I'll still work on assets and that kind of stuff, but it's also about getting the artists to kind of get in sync with what the art style of the game is and basically get as close as possible to how I think about it as well. So we're all sort of working together and producing assets and style that kind of comes to life when we all start working on it together. So I'm gonna come straight back to you for my next question, which is, it's kind of a big one, so prepare yourself. I'm interested in your process. So basically the kind of art that you need to do, whatever you would consider, you know, the art that you do in your role, what's your process for that? You know, from, from the very beginning when you're coming up with ideas to actually practically applying it, you know, in, in your day-to-day -day job. Mm -hmm. That's a big question. That's like a year of my life. <laughs> um, so it all starts with sketching. I would say like with a sketchbook or, or Procreate or whatever you like to use, like I'll just start with, pure pencil sketches of it might be elements of the game mechanics might be starting to think about characters but I feel like it all comes back to starting with drawing um, and it's a really quick way to communicate your ideas to the rest of the team and then you kind of go through different layers once the the game design is sort of like got its it's sort of foundation, then we can start building on things together. I'll do more fleshed out concepts, maybe with some color and some atmosphere. And then as we move along, start to like Kata get into Unity and start putting some assets in and seeing how they look and feel in a 3D space, if you're doing a 3D game. Um, and yeah, I think, I think a lot of it's just trying to get from that process of how do I get the, the energy and kind of fun of the concepts and paintings or however you're doing those into game assets. I think one thing that tends to happen is it gets a little colder when you get into assets, like you lose a little bit of that initial warmth and energy. Um, so yeah, a big part of that transition is to try and get that energy back in. That's so interesting. I never thought about that. Of course it gets, I guess, a little bit colder once you have to, you know, take it from that first kind of hand-drawn form. That's, that's so interesting. Chris, um, uh, sorry, uh, Maxim, would you say that that's similar for you? Because, you know, you're also working with shapes that I guess, you know, we're talking robots, they could feel a little bit cold. Well, yeah, but I, I think uh, like uh, the others are mostly, uh, they work in 2D and much more in concept. And uh, all our concepts are, at least for my department, are done in 3D. Um, there is some, uh, there's an art director who does uh, some designs, but then the, the robots all get designed in 3D because they have to be able to move and, uh, you know, solid objects, we try to have as little uh, intersections as possible, so we have to test constantly, so we um, do concept sculpts in ZBrush, so I guess that's our warm place, and then we uh, create something uh, like a, a speed model which goes into the, the engine and we do some speed textures and just to see and animation can try it and 
really quickly we have something in game so all the rest of the team can keep working and we can you know really work on the on the details and, and fleshing it out and making it look really cool while still you know adhering to what we already done so you know that we don't later get people saying like what but, but now it looks completely different so well it does but it, it looks better but it has the same functionality so yeah i, I you know i i i like the well yeah i guess it, it doesn't feel we feel cool to me but that's uh i'm in assets so sorry chris <laughs> anna for you is your process different now that you know players won't see what you've created for a very long time you know you, you have um less immediacy say of of player feedback um i'd say that it's definitely a little bit scrappier uh, just because time is of the essence. Uh, like my initial sketches for projects are nightmarish. Like they will never see the light of day. They're incredibly cursed, but they get the idea there, uh, which is the main thing. Uh, I think when I was working more in uh, game production, because what I used to do was uh, work through the entire pipeline. Uh, it would almost be a thinking process for me. Uh, and I would still kind of render things out quite neatly, um, but I was also figuring out because I would build everything in 3D as well. Like I'd just be given a gray box level and kind of people would just say, go ham, and I would. Um, so I uh, would create more polished imagery, uh, but then also a lot of that thinking would translate into the way that I would texture the assets and kind of place them in the scene as well. Um, so I'd say it starts off a bit messier, um, but uh, it still has to be reasonably presentable by the end of it, uh, given it's going to be um, shown to more than just uh, me and my uh, like co-designers and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a mixture of both. It's a mixture of both. I do now want to see those cursed sketches, please, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. They are buried at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Catherine, talk us through your process. Does this, you know, are these answers familiar to you or do you do something completely different? No, they're very familiar, especially Chris Cox's um, process is very similar to mine. Um, Cause I, I think, so Chris is the same as me. We work in quite small teams. So you end up working from concept and sketches through to like, like really key art and then actually working on the assets that are in the game as well. So I think that kind of mess, that kind of, thing you were talking about Chris where you were mentioning how it can get cold was more like a self critique where it's like you start sketching something and you're really loose um, when to start out with when you're making the concepts I usually sit on the sofa when I sketch because I find it more relaxing because when I'm at my computer I'm like thinking about deadlines and thinking about like work and everything like that and that like that kind of restricts me a little bit so I prefer to like kind of sketch more loosely but as soon as you start to move that stuff into the game space you find the restrictions start to come in like you start to freak out a bit about how tight things look and then suddenly you're losing all that energy as you move into like the actual game space so balancing that is like quite an interesting and annoying prospect <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah because you there's so many times where we'll kind of like i'll look with the team at sketches and go oh that's a lot of energy isn't it and then we'll look at the game and be like <laughs> much tighter but yeah it, it, no one sees the sketches so that's good <laughs> I mean that kind of very perfectly almost as if you knew leads on to my next question which was going to be about balancing that you know I, this sounds so wanky but your your truth as an artist with you know the kind of technical demands that that game design requires because it's not somewhere where you can just go ham <laughs> as Anna put it it is somewhere where you know there are other members of the team who who are going to come in and say no you can't do that you can't have that that's too big that's too you know so how do you balance the vision that you have as an artist with the technical limitations of games sorry I yeah, prematurely answer that um, go yeah. for it <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that um yeah like I, I think at first it's healthy to not think about the limitations and to just go wild because that's where all the good ideas come from um but eventually you have to kind of knuckle down and you have to work with people who are dealing with the tech side and then that's where you start to learn a bit more about what's possible and the limitations and in, in some ways that sounds limiting, but also the limitation can breed quite exciting ideas. Um, so like, yeah, there will usually be, it, with every team it's always different. There's always a different limitation with every kind of team, but like technically um, 
it tends to get like, yeah, you tend to kind of learn a language between you and the team and what works and what you can repeat and this, this kind of thing. Yeah. Maxim, your role feels kind of a little more technically focused from the very beginning. So do you do you find that you have an easier time striking that balance between what you want to do as an artist and, and what you have to do as a gameplay designer? No, <laughs> it's exactly <laughs> like that. It's um, uh, it's very, yeah, we start out with the designs and as soon as we, you know, pretty quickly we go in engine and with the other teams and then it becomes very much a back and forth. But I... I actually enjoyed, uh, you know, talking to the other teams and finding out what they're doing and learning a little bit about it. So I'm, I'm really trying to broaden my own horizons at the same time. So uh, yes, it's, it's quite technical. And I must say that com like uh, compared to the movie industry where I was before, which is much more sequential. So it starts with assets and then it moves up, you know, uh, to rigging. And then once they're done, they, you know, they're done, they're, they're out of your hands. And in games, they just, in you know, they are being made at the same time. So it's sort of um, sequential, well, uh, you know, basically everything is getting worked on at the same time and worked until the end. So, and much, there is much more, well, the VFX are technical. I don't want to say anything bad about that because I love it, but this is uh, for me a whole new level and uh, it, I, I really enjoy it. So yeah, I, I don't mind it the technical stuff and you know not saying that anybody else does that but for me it really works and i'm quite yeah enjoying it so um yeah that uh it's good chris for you are there when you're kind of trying to strike this balance are there things that are essential for you you know is there something that you think okay no matter what i have to be able to look at my art and think this or feel this you know no matter what the technical limitations are uh yeah i'd say so i think because you have your intention of the art direction of the game. And if that art direction is something that's like unique or a selling point, like, um, I don't know, like, like the first example to head is like Wind Waker, where it's all cell shaded, right? So everything needs to have that look, everything needs to fit in with that idea of two tone cell shading. So things should have flat color, things should be simple, simple silhouettes. And I think it's, you, you basically have like cornerstones of what make that art style work. And some of them you can't really compromise on, otherwise it won't have an art style. It will just be an amalgam mass of assets that are thrown into a game engine. Um, however, like Kath said, at a certain point, you've got to compromise. Um, when you were talking about you know people on the team who maybe don't want you to have that expression in the same way it basically sounds like like developers who are trying to just do their damn jobs and we're trying to stop them as artists sometimes it feels like that's the balance um but actually it can be quite good you can actually once you have that restriction to work within i think the exciting part is seeing how far you can push it um, and that's where tech art can be really, really useful as well, like Maxim's talking about too, like how far can you push those assets, which are basically just, you know, models a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah. Anna, it seemed like you were kind of fervently agreeing when, you know, everyone was talking about the fact that, you know, sometimes creativity does blossom because of the limitations. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, there's been a number of projects that I've worked on uh, that have just, flourished because of that. Uh, I tend to do it almost a different way round. Um, I really love the kind of um, visual problem solving of essentially being given a bunch of things that I can't do and I'm just figure out how to maximize uh, on what I've got essentially. Um, so for example, in some projects I've worked on, uh, they are very, very limited in how much you can have on screen, maybe because they are mobile VR, uh, which means it's rendering twice on a phone for a headset, which you don't have a lot to work with uh, when that happens. Um, and so uh, it's all about making decisions that can reinforce the uh, narrative of the game or the uh, kind of aesthetics and the core pillars of the game. Um, one example is uh, how a VR game I worked on was set in a digital world. Uh, and so I used the uh, level of detail within uh, the game itself. Uh, there's a system called Lodding uh, that generates uh, assets around you. Uh, and we kind of 
developed a series of tools so that it kind of looked like these objects were unfolding around you, um, which was great because it looked cute. Uh, but also it was real efficient, which is also super handy, but it reinforced this kind of like tech vibe. Um, and uh, yeah, I really love finding those neat little solutions that are both efficient, but also can kind of uh, be really creative and interesting as well. Maxim, you mentioned earlier, obviously, that you have a film background. So I'm interested in what skills for you are transferable and what definitely isn't. So uh, I worked in assets in movies as well, uh, did sort of the same role, asset lead, uh, and I thought, well, that's just going to be a simple transition. Uh, and it, it was and it wasn't, as in that, yes, I'm still leading a team and uh, creating assets. And then, you know, I thought like, well, a model is a model and a texture is a texture. And uh, it's actually way more involved, I found, than uh, in, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I was in movies for 20 years. So for me, that seemed like, oh, this is this process is all super clear. And now that I'm in games, I go like, wow, this is, it, you know, it feels like you're making a puzzle every day and trying to fit everything together really small, um, you know, because in movies, you, you know, you can make it really big because it's going to get rendered anyway so you know and if it's going to take 20 hours then it's going to take 20 hours per frame which is not uncommon but in games it has to be you know 60 frames a second 30 frames a second so every byte every little bit counts so you're constantly thinking like well if i change that around or I do that different and fit it in different so you I, it feels like you know making a puzzle every day which you know it's not a bad thing it's fun but uh, yeah, that for me, that was that was a, a transition. And yeah, like I said before, like the the working together with the other teams and not like one after the other, which you know has its ups and downs. But I, I you know, it's good. Anna, you also you have done children's TV, haven't you? So same question, you know, for you, what are the skills that are transferred across, and and what have you been surprised that hasn't? Uh, yes, yeah, so I art directed the 2D CBBS show Love Monster. It's on iPlayer. It's very cute. Um, but it was a complete change of what I was doing. But I'm a sucker for saying yes to things that seem a bit like out there and different. So I just kind of went for it. Um, but there's a lot that transfers across. Uh, just having an eye for uh, detail, uh, obviously drawing and painting, um, designing props and environments. Uh, a lot of it was pretty straightforward. I think the things that uh, stood out to me as being different were just kind of the uh, little bits of language that I would sometimes trip up on um, because designers are people that do art in animation and designers are people that put the game together uh, in uh, engine, like figure out how levels play in games. Um, but uh, yeah, still incredibly transferable. Um, I definitely learned some really cool stuff from it though. Uh, a lot about uh, simplification because I was having to work with these 2D assets that uh, I had to be really, really careful, would read clearly on screen. Uh, acting space as well was something that I'm really, uh, I'm really mindful of now when I'm kind of creating an environment just because I tend to clutter things up a little bit just because I like lots and lots of stuff. Um, but it's all very, very transferable. Uh, and uh, I think it's pretty straightforward to kind of be able to jump across, at least when you're doing like something like uh, concept art or viz dev, just takes a, maybe a couple of months, at least for me, of adjusting. <laughs> Well, let's talk art styles, because that's a question that comes up a lot, I can already see, is in, is in our Q&A section. So, Chris, I'll come to you first. When we're talking about art styles, is there any style in particular that, A, you know, works best in games or that people should focus on? And if you have a very distinctive style as an artist, is it worth sticking with that? Or is there something to be said for being quite versatile, given, you know, the range of styles that we see across, across the games industry? Okay, yeah. Um, so I think there, there isn't one art style you should gravitate towards generally for games. Um, I think that there, there's a whole, like games can look like anything. It's like saying what, you know, what should a painting look like? Like at this stage with the way tech is going, games can look like absolutely anything. 
which is a little daunting when, you know, in the 90s, a lot of games look like, you know, baked potatoes. They're all just like low poly and like limited palettes and stuff. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, personally, I think that you should start by following art styles that just interest you and excite you. I don't think you think, what should games look like? You should just be like, oh man, I love the look of this particular game, probably Hades at the moment. And you're just like, cool, this is, everything is right here. And you get excited about it. So I think early on, see stuff that excites you and start working on stuff like that, I suppose, like mixed in with maybe the art style you've developed so far. Um, I suppose like Maxim probably have ideas about this as well, but like if you are working on like, like bigger budget, technical, big team stuff um, or AAA stuff, you are gonna probably start leaning towards some level of realism and realism in your assets. And I can't necessarily speak for Anna and Catherine exactly, but I, I would say that we lean more towards heavily stylized stuff. So that's one distinction you could make early on. Like, do I want to work in more heavily stylized? Maybe it could be something that's almost graphical or am I more interested in AAA level stuff, like stuff that's leaning towards realism or that sort of thing. And it's like, that's not, neither is, is more valid than the other. I think it comes down to what interests you the most. Catherine, for you, do you have a style that you lean towards? Is there something that you consider quite distinctively, Catherine? And also kind of a similar question. Do you think it's worth fleshing out your, your portfolio, you know, the work that you can do? Um, yeah, I feel like um, it, my art style comes from, so I do illustration on the side. So there's a lot of like art, art influence that'll come from that side, basically. But it depends on the project. Like, I also think that you know, the art style should be driven by the project itself as well. So if the project, like for example, South of Circle is set, you know, in the 1950s or 40s, I'm not sure, don't fact check me on that. But like the, basically the idea that it looks like a screen print from like kind of like railway posters, this kind of thing. And that kind of blends in with the concept of the story. And that's, I think that's a really nice thing to do as well. Like I'm not, I, I like, I'm keen to go into games and do like my painted illustration style, but I'm also keen to go into games and service the games that basically and what like the art it needs um and in terms of my portfolio i don't know yeah i guess just make nice art <laughs> for whatever you're doing like it doesn't have to look like my style you know like it's, i think what i got i geared towards is making sure that each game has heart it has atmosphere like the, it, the story is like told through the art in the in sense of color and that kind of thing and that's kind of how i'd approach it basically oh that's my phone <laughs> <laughs> Maxim is that is that true for you as well would you say that say if you were looking at somebody's portfolio it doesn't matter if it doesn't exactly match the work you're doing or, or the role that they're applying for what what are you kind of looking to see in somebody's portfolio uh yeah so like like Chris was saying I'm I'm like my uh expertise is more in realistic um and and I find the art in you know making it look uh, really rusty or, you know, something that you can relate to in the game world. Um, a lot of the, um, I, I'm involved with helping with the concept, but I, you know, again, the concept artists usually design stuff that we try to um, make and then give our interpretation of in 3D. So when I look at portfolios, I, look at how they make the assets. Uh, and uh, uh, I saw the question in the q and I was peeking, like, what is an asset? An asset is, um, well, anything that can appear in a game. So it can be a character, it can be a vase, it can be uh, a tree, it can be a robot, it can be basically anything that is made as a 3D model and shown and used in the game is an asset. Uh, so that's a term we use. Um, but, um, uh, there is a lot of portfolios, and th these are the things I look at. Look, I look at 3D modeled and um, textured, and uh, you know, usually um, shown through uh, substance or something like that. And on ArtStation, I uh, I check out a lot of stuff, and there um, I try to look for original stuff. So it, it and because there is so many people who make a gun, make a, a tank, make a, a, a car, 
and you know and that's great but that shouldn't be like the one thing you show because everybody's doing that and um yeah i, I you know i, I want to see something really it, it it just has to be technically really good so i i want to see the the wireframe i want to see what they've done for the textures and stuff so i know what's what's going on underneath and not just see a picture so yeah and it's hard to you know, there's so much out there and there's so many great people. So it's, it's hard to find the right people sometimes, or, you know, just because you don't see the, the forest for the trees. Yeah, no, I mean, that definitely makes sense. And I'm interested in how much you can bring your own personality, your own style to work. You know, when you are working on a game, it is a game that has to, you know, in most cases have reasonably mass appeal. So how much do you get to stamp you know, your brand as an artist on something? Uh, I mean, I've been very, very lucky that I've been able to have a pretty big influence on projects in terms of the art style that I've brought. Uh, I think a big part of that is because I uh, have worked in smaller teams uh, and I'm also obnoxious and just uh, persistent uh, and kind of annoy my way into getting to do that. Um, but I think uh, that has been a really wonderful opportunity but I think there's a lot of value as well in having to adapt to a specific house style and finding the ways that you can elevate that as well. Um, working on the uh, TV show Love Monster was one of those moments. It was completely different to the kind of thing that I uh, paint, that I really work on. It's very uh, line driven. Um, it's not really very painterly at all. Uh, so it was a big change for me. But it's funny, I would show people the uh, backgrounds and the environments that I'd worked on and developed, and people would still say, oh, I can see that that's your work. And I think it's not just the rendering, but it's the content. It's uh, the way that you set up scenes. It's the little dioramas that you like to make in the corner on like a dresser or something. Um, and so you can still bring a lot of character and a lot of like, authenticity to pretty much any style. Uh, you can still bring a lot of yourself to the table regardless of what you're working on. Which artists or, you know, games that artists have worked on inspire you? What are you looking at and thinking, oh, you know, this is exactly what I want to see? I mean, sorry to be mentioned, the Hades. <laughs> Hades. Um, yeah, Super Jive just oh amazing um games that inspire me uh oh god like i'm super super interested in uh kind of the experimental stuff or like the narrative kind of philosophical stuff so uh huge fan of kentucky route zero um i also love just the kind of cozy feeling of uh things like animal crossing uh, i've been playing an awful lot of that as well um i think just I really like just the um, friendly small details in things so uh, Spirit Bearer uh, has been great for that it's absolutely stunning and the attention to detail in the animation is just oh it's all so good it's all so so good yeah those were very good picks I feel bad that I've got to you know <laughs> hand over now you've already said hey dude you said Spirit Bearer we've had Sorry. you know really great stuff mentioned already <laughs> Maxim I'm going to come to you and say which which games or artists inspire you um wow yeah um i was thinking about that while um and and i was answering and i really really enjoyed hollow knight last year and it was or was it the year before already it was made by three guys in australia and it's it's looks really really great and it's simple but yeah it has a lot of atmosphere and i it i i'm uh i know it's a bit you know, drab and, and, and sad and all that, but I love The Last of Us 2 and the craftsmanship in that is just exquisite. It's just all the, every time you you craft something in there and they have made a full animation for everything that's in there, it just, just kills me. It's just amazing. And I know it's a very sad game, but um, yeah, I, I still think it's amazing work. So yeah, that inspires me. 
I mean, you wouldn't know that it was a sad game given how much game designers rave over it. <laughs> you know, all the little details in it that I've heard people pick yeah. out, whether it is, you know, the rope or the clothing or, you know, all the things that game designers really appreciate. I've never mind heard blowing. people rhapsody. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> that's, mind blowing. Yeah, that's what I've heard a lot. Uh, Chris, tell me your inspirations. Uh, Parappa the Rapper. That's it. No. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anything, anything that's like, kind of like really, <laughs> it's almost the opposite of Maxim, even though I very much respect his, his taste. Um, really like super minimal stuff, like few colors as possible. Uh, when there's things like, like little cutouts of scenes, that kind of stuff. So like, um, I really like things like Bird Alone, to see Jet Bird Alone, George Batchelor did that, was very nice. Um, short Hike. Uh, creature in the well, like just stuff where it's, I suppose it's pretty illustrative kind of thing. Um, in terms of like bigger games, like, I don't know, Jet Set Radio, <laughs> that kind of thing. Anything, anything is just like super expressive and a little bit, a little bit strange. Um, and I really gravitate towards that kind of thing. Uh, those, that gave a really clear picture of what your what your taste is. Those it sums like... up me as a person, to be honest, as well as my taste in art. So, okay, I like that. That's a good mix. That's a good. If I had to pick games that represent me, I don't know why I choose, but I love the mix that you just picked there, Catherine. We've had big games mentioned now. We've had a lot of names. So you know, unfortunately, you're in the final position. So who oh. who inspires you? I'm trying not to say Mario. Um, <laughs> you can Journey. say Mario. <laughs> Journey. Journey journey broke my brain um ever since it was released it's so beautiful and like i think it's the blend i think it's anything that blends music like really good music with really good atmospheric visuals like basically break my brain and uh another one is kind of like recently inside and little nightmares both those games oh uh -huh. like this just the atmosphere it's like atmosphere 101 it's like crazy good and then um, most Nintendo titles always give me a little something. I go, oh, I like that, like that kind of thing. Uh, Zelda Wind Waker, obviously. That's a really obvious one, but I left it to last as a treat. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was great. <laughs> a detail really that I, else now. Yeah, a detail that I love in Inside is there are three different uh, animations for the character pushing, like swimming in the water whilst pushing a. Uh, like palette, like a wooden palette, like the attention to detail is Serious? mind blowing. Yeah. And I think he does it like once. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. I love that. There we go. See, uncovering all these little tidbits. This is this is a BAFTA craft panel, you know, we're delving into those tiny details. So little fact that you probably didn't know, because I definitely didn't. Now, we're going to jump to Q&A because I'm, I'm quietly watching them tick up and I, I want to get to them before uh, before it's too late. So let's let me have a quick scan through i think we'll start off with first of all let's uh, i'll widen this out but christina mccauley asked any recommendations for courses to do for someone looking to go to art or college uni but i think i'd also flesh that out and just say in general you know if somebody watching now wants to be an artist where do they start catherine i'll come to you for that uh I, i'm i'm kind of biased in this and i feel like you should start at, a, at an art uni because I think if you're going to go into art and the games, the fundamentals are hugely important, but I'm completely biased because that's my experience. And I know so many people who have not done that. So yeah, I'll move on to someone else. Probably. I was going to say, does anybody want to jump in? Because obviously that, that's really interesting. That's you know not an opinion I don't always hear. So does anyone have kind of a different, a different suggestion or a different take? I, um, oh, no, you go, you go. No, well, I, I, I did, I, did um, I studied computer science and uh, because I, I wanted to make games and then they did teach you how to make games. They teach you about databases and operating systems and boring stuff. Uh, and then I did night school on the side, but the computer skills did help me a lot. And I, it, it, I think uh, in, in college or anything, they teach you the games, but to really learn how to do it, you have to, you know, uh, do an internship somewhere and really the the work ethic is it's so much more than just knowing how to do uh, the the programs but I guess uh, from an artist uh, point of view yes you do need to practice 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 it's it's a lot of self-study I found but 
Yeah, I mean, um, I went directly to, uh, well, I did a foundation art course that was terrible, um, but it taught me a lot of things that I don't like. Um, but then I went on to do a, a game art course at Montfort University, uh, and there's a few of them. Um, and I was taught, like, it was very kind of fundamentals driven, uh, which is why I really liked it. Um, and uh, then it had a pretty strong focus on doing 3D and uh, working in engine, that kind of thing. Um, and there's a bunch of reputable uh, unis. Like I'd say absolutely do your research. Uh, I went through every single games course in the country and looked at like graduate work because I'm a nerd. Um, but I uh, really, really liked the kind of stuff that's coming out of DMU. There's also uh, Teesside. Uh, I think uh, Abate is pretty good. Um, I think Bournemouth as well. Just just do some research um, and try and speak to uh, graduates and stuff. But it's also not necessary. Like, I don't know, who here has ever been asked for a degree? <laughs> I haven't. So um, it's not super, super vital. Uh, but it is helpful to have that space. So it really depends on how you learn. Fantastic. Chris, was there anything you wanted to add there? Um, just that, I mean, I would really recommend going for a craft of some kind, if it's illustration or photography or whatever it might be. I think like going for something you're really passionate about, it can be transferable into games. Um, so, I mean, I did graphic design at uni quite a long time ago now. And it's, it did give me a certain grounding for things like legibility, which is really important for assets or color coding things, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think, I think like Anna was saying, like do your research and find the course that fits with what you're most interested in. It sounds like I'm beating this drum again and again of what, what are you interested in? Because that makes it easy to work. If you like love it so much it's not even like work it's just like cool I just I can't wait to think of characters or to do some environment designs then it just dovetails easily so if you want to make 3d environments do a 3d art course if you really love illustration do an illustration course and there is a place in games for most of those disciplines in some form or another no, that's a great message. I really, yeah, I think that is really important. I know you said, you know, you keep saying about do what interests you and, you know, find somewhere and go towards the thing that you're passionate about. But I do think that's something people forget in games and they get a bit overwhelmed. So that's really great advice. We had a question from James Nolan and said, he said, hi, I work as a game producer who primarily works with artists. Can any of you think of any personal examples of working with team members who aren't artists where they helped you get past something that was blocking you or helped spark your creativity? Um, Catherine, I'll come to you for that one. Oh, Catherine, you're muted. Firstly, I'm, I'm Catherine. Mute. Yeah, <laughs> come on. It is it is November 2020. If you haven't figured out mute yet, <laughs> I, I've, this has happened many times. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I tend to ask everyone on the team for ideas um, because I think that's important. I think you can be too narrow minded within your own, especially with the small indie teams. You can be narrow minded in your own space and way of doing things. And often I like to like present ideas to multiple people in the team. So whether it be from the game design side or the like, technical side or this kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's kind of a difficult question because I'm not sure like um, I've, I've, I'm trying to think of a really good example. I don't know if any of you guys have a good example of that. Well, one of the questions that I didn't have time for earlier, but think that this kind of ties into is I'm also interested in the skills that are not kind of creative or, you know, something that you think of as being linked to an artist that help you in, in your career. So if anybody has kind of a, a take on that, I'd also be interested in that. Yeah, because, um, uh, sorry, I, I'm jumping yeah, in, jump but in. Uh, I think uh, uh, the production is hugely important, except, uh, 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 especially if, you know, the company is uh, bigger and um, I, I really enjoy working with producers because it makes my life easier and I try to make their life easier. And uh, I find that it helps to organize my process and get everything, you know, sort of uh, quantifiable. And um, yeah, so production is super important. Um, and then um, I, I guess rigging 
uh, for me is also, and I wouldn't say that's not creative because it's very creative, but it's way more technical. Uh, that really helps me make decisions on how stuff should move and how um, and and animation, which is a you know another hugely creative uh, team, and they help us a lot because they think about stuff so differently than us. And we go like, well, you got this big thing, and just make it move. And they go like, well, actually, it can't because this and this and this. And and I go like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. So we make ch- changes. So yeah, it's a back and forth between a lot of teams. And um, I, I think like most of the like almost everything, even even coding is is creative and um, you know, can teach us stuff. But uh, yeah, so I I talk to the other teams all the time, and especially you know, uh, stuff like uh, production uh, is hugely beneficial to us. And like, they get creative with their spreadsheets and their um, organizing. So, you know, and and they love it. So that's great. (laughs) Anna, for you, you know, what, what are the skills that you value outside of, you know, the core skills of being an artist? Um, I mean, I was going to say spreadsheets and as an artist, I can color code them beautifully. Um, but alongside that, uh, just good communication and soft skills, uh, like they kind of get derided a little bit, but, um, you can draw like phenomenally, but if you can't communicate or, um, you are just kind of a bit rude, then people probably don't want to work with you that much. Um, so being able to like communicate your idea effectively is really important, especially uh, when you're working in games. Like it was much easier in animation because like everyone can draw, including the producers. But when you're in games, you've got a uh, huge mix of people from completely different disciplines in design and programming and audio and production, um, just all over the place uh, in terms of how they communicate. And it's really important to be able to kind of build those links uh, and understand each other because uh, you can't just talk about things like, oh, I'm using this contrapost or oh, I made there's a visual tangent here. Like no one, their eyes are gonna glaze over if you talk about re-apologizing. Like they've got no clue. Um, so you need to be able to communicate in an effective way. Nick, what for you are the skills that you value outside of artistry? Oh, sorry, Chris, I'm reading the next name. I mean, Chris, I'm so sorry, I'm reading questions. <laughs> Could I be a Nick though? Could I have the power of a Nick? Yeah, <laughs> we'll combine that with you. Nicks are very <laughs> confident. Can I just say, Chris? Um, could you please ask the question again? Because now I'm thinking about Nick. I know, we're all thinking about Nick. I mean, Nick, I blame you for this. Uh, I'm asking- <laughs> Nick is legion. You, well, Sorry. Yes, exactly. I'm asking the kind of skills outside of your skills as an artist. So what outside of that do you value and think that makes you better at your job? I was gonna I was gonna say what Anna said, which is soft skills, but I'm actually gonna say it again because it's so important. Um, or just like communication, learning how to communicate with other people. Um, and this is something like I think all artists go through having to figure out you're not like the center of the universe and that art isn't the most important thing in the entire game. It's really hard to get out there. I'm not out there yet. No. It, take, it takes a while to get there, but I think um, being excited about other people's disciplines helps quite a lot and like what they're adding to the game and getting involved in that kind of stuff. Like I would say, if you're going to be an artist in games, I think you should have a pretty healthy interest in game design because the art style you make for the game, like the best looking playing games, those things dovetail beautifully. It's not just, you're not just painting a fence, which I think some sometimes can happen where you're like, well, I'll make it look really pretty and then I'll be fine. I think if you have a really good awareness of game design and what makes the game appealing in that way, then you can create art that complements that really well. So yeah, be aware of game design. Mm. This kind of leads nicely into the next question, which, sorry, is not Nick. Um, I've seen a question from Iggy, which is, you know, maybe even a better name. Um, They're worried that if you can't afford industry standard software, that you aren't going to be able to become an artist, that you won't be able to develop the skills you need to. You know, Chris, do you think that that's true? No, no. You can, I mean, there's loads of free software and you don't need good stuff, honestly. Like, I think... 
I remember I had a friend years ago who was really like, I need to get Cintiq. Once I get Cintiq, then I'll be a good artist. And like, no, not true at all. You can have the smallest, cheapest whack on. You can use all the sort of free, like um, image manipulation software. Blender is obviously huge at the moment and all the rendering stuff you can do in Blender. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, um, companies, although they may use more expensive software, if you are displaying the talent of how appealing are your 3D models, how good are your concepts, they're not going to care whether you made it in Photoshop or whether you made it in GIMP or Blender or Maya. Uh, I think most like reputable studios will be able to look at someone's portfolio and get excited about the content. And then be like, cool. I mean, because to be honest with you, if you're going from say Blender to Maya, there's there's a bit of transfer with stuff like shortcuts and some of the application, but it wouldn't stop me from hiring someone if they had like really exceptional eye for detail or appealing unique art style. Is most there software, else? most software you can get like an artist license or a, a pretty cheap license anyway. So, and yeah, like Chris was saying, I would never start looking at the software they use uh you know if the main software in 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 uh, movies the main software is often uh, in the companies i worked at maya uh so we did look at it but yeah again it's it's not the end of the world if somebody uses something else or is you know if they can do the work it's not the tools it's the the, the person who does it Brilliant. Iggy, there you go. Hopefully that's a reassuring answer. Um, Catherine, I'm going to come to you for this next question. Nick, you're finally getting your chance. This is your moment. Okay, so here's my Nick's... question for Catherine. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. <laughs> Nick's question was, for those interested in joining an indie studio or a kind of smaller team, are there additional skills they need to, to build, you know, to work within a team that doesn't have as many people on it? I think um, with indie teams, bring as many skills as you can. It's not like essential, but it does help a lot. Like I think I started out with animation and illustration skills. So having those two things definitely got me my first job. But I think if you can come into a team and be able to do a bit of 3D, a bit of, you know, like even a bit of like um, tech art or something like that, like any kind of stuff that you can contribute um, is really good because being in an indie team is about having multiple hats basically. Um, yeah, for sure. All right, well, I've got my final question because I'm going to ask everybody this one. It's from Oliver Hopley and he's kind of um, questioning what's next for him. And so he asked all of you what your future goals are. And I thought that's kind of a nice place to end, particularly because we, we didn't get a chance to touch on it too much, but there are so many different roles within art in games. And so I think it's always interesting to take a look at people's career paths and you know where they want to take their art within this industry. So Anna, I'll kick things off with you. Oh gosh, uh, I mean, unfortunately I want to do everything ever, uh, which doesn't make life very easy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm just interested in so many things. So uh, in terms of games, uh, I would love to uh, get back to kind of art directing games. Creative direction is something I'm really interested in because of the, uh, the design stuff that I'm like super, super fascinated by as well. Um, also create my own clothing line, um, but that's just like a person. I wanna, I wanna write a book, like maybe illustrate it. Um, I just like set up a like online show. There's, I just like doing everything and making things that are really emotionally impactful to people uh, that can represent um, them that they can feel uh, seen by and uh, kind of feel like they're being cherished by the kind of media that I'm making. Just stuff that's emotionally valuable um, and supportive. Just, yeah, making kind spaces for people where I can. That was so wholesome. I'd have expected nothing less from you. What a gorgeous, <laughs> <laughs> what a gorgeous answer. <laughs> Thank you. Also, Anna's already made a start on her own clothing line. So do go and find her on Twitter. Go and check that out. Google her name and Tarot. You'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> you babe, thank you. Not all. Maxim, tell me about your kind of, whether career plans very specifically or, you know, what you'd love to do as an artist in the next kind of decade. The next decade, wow. Uh, <laughs> so I've been very fortunate uh, over the last, 
two decades to work on some, you know, some quite big Hollywood projects and in movies. I've, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed it. I had a lot of success. And now I want to do the same in games. I really, I really enjoy where I work and I want to, you know, actually, you know, I, I am Dutch and I'm back in Amsterdam after years in London and uh, I love London. It's awesome. But um, yeah, it's great being home again as well. And now that I'm here, I, I want to make my mark here and really, because um, I enjoy working at a big company, nothing against like, I, you know, it would be great to work at a smaller indie company. Uh, but I find that working with a lot of people, you can, you know, you, you all stand on each other's shoulders. So you make something really big. And I, I enjoy being a part of uh, a small part of that. Uh, so, and I want to see, you know, that I can grow into the company and, you know, get more, you know, even grow above the role at some point and just get more involved with the direction of the company and maybe, you know, help create great games because I always love games. And as I said, I got into, I, I started um, computer science, which was boring, uh, but good. Uh, um, to make games and then got sidetracked into movies for a long time. Well, commercials, movies, and, you know, uh, golden logos and television to start with. So let's not glamorize it too much. Um, and uh, yeah, now is my chance to go into games and uh, I'm enjoying it very much. And that's where I want to head it for the next decade or more. I want to, I'm here to stay. Oh, I'm glad that you said films weren't that glamorous because I did think when you were like, oh, I got sidetracked and I just ended up, you know, in the movie business. I was like, that's not normally what a career sidetrack looks like. It's normally no. a little bit. I got lucky, <laughs> but, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you definitely did. That's a very, that is, a, no matter what you say, it's a glamorous career sidetrack. Now, Chris, tell me, tell me all your plans, please, for the next 10 years. What are you aiming towards? I have planned it all out and now I'm going to tell you all of it. Um, I yeah I mean I think I'm just really interested in making more game art basically like like art styles that you don't see that commonly in games like I, I, I think there's a bit like arty games or games like minimal art styles like the genie's out of the bottle for quite a few years now and, and lots of companies are doing that really really well but I think I want to like yeah those kind of illustrations would be like oh man I wish there was a game that looked like that I kind of want to like chase that a little bit and and like with my own concepts or stuff that has inspired me like I'm really interested in just making games that like you know a screenshot just looks like something nice that you'd like to like hang up or look at um and yeah so that's really my only career goal <laughs> I'm kind of I'm kind of quite happy um because you know I get to do art direction and visual development right now so in terms of the actual action of my career I'm pretty happy there so I think it's it's more just pushing forward how interesting games can look and trying to like, you know, take a leaf from other industries completely, like like art and all that kind of stuff, yeah. I love that. That makes me feel so excited for games. I love talking to artists because you've all got such a wonderful way of describing the future of games. It makes me incredibly excited. So it's if you could just realistic. get on with it, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, Catherine, tell us what your plans are, what you see in the next couple of years for you. Um, yeah, I've, so I recently did a kind of a narrative game and a little bit of a narrative moment there where I was kind of co-writing and stuff. So I'd kind of like to be more involved in the narrative side as well as the art side in the future. Um, continue to do more art direction. And I think eventually make my own game one day, hopefully. But I think I'd like to, I, the kind of games I want to work on or the kind of games I want to make is stuff that can be a therapy to people and to essentially help people and work through some emotions, that stuff, because I believe in that stuff quite a lot. So that's quite, yeah, 10 year kind of goal. It's going to take me 10 years to even like get the sofa. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's just 2020 in a nutshell. Yeah, I'm going to about 2030, I'll get off the sofa and then, you know, <laughs> then the real work will begin. <laughs> well, thank you all so, so much. I feel like we had a million questions. I'm so sorry for everyone that we didn't get a chance to get to uh, get to in the q and I know we really focused on Nick for a while there and I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> we we did have some fantastic questions. So thank you if you sent any in. Thank you all for watching. And of course, a huge thank you to our wonderful guests, Catherine, Anna, and not Nick, 
Chris and Maxim. And obviously a huge thank you to BAFTA for putting this on. Another wonderful event in the BAFTA Guru lineup. We've got one more game event coming your way. That's on the 26th. And we're talking programming. We're talking best practices for programmers. So I'm really looking forward to that one. It's going to be something a little bit different. But for now, that's it. We've talked everything you need to know about the craft of Games Out. We've had a wonderful time doing it. So thank you very much. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>